two or three are gathered, you are there in our midst. Lord, we welcome you to be among us today, and we celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. I will sing. I will sing. Come on, everybody, and sing. Sing now, I will sing. All this good to say. And his kindness, the mercies of the Lord show. Say, I will sing. One more time, I will sing. Say, sing. Kindness, the mercies of the Lord are shown. Say, I will see. Everybody say now. Say, holy. Glory to the Lamb of God. Hey, to the Lamb. Oh, singing praises to the awesome God. Mercies of the Lord are sure. Oh, everybody say now. Say holy. Oh, the Lord to the Lamb of God. Hey, to the Lamb. Oh, singing praise to the awesome God. Marvelous, he has done marvelous things. 
to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody say hallelujah.
He's able, he's able, he's able. My God is more than able. My God is able, he say now. He is able. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. My God. My God is more than able. Come on, some brothers and say more than able. More than able. Yes. He's able. Yes. He's able. He is more than able. As we continue with our online worship service today, let us bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you today to give you honor and praise. You are worthy of the praise because you are the source of all that is good. You are the source of all of our blessings, Lord. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse our hearts of sinful thoughts, Lord, as we enter into your presence with praise. Lord, we give thanks to you for every gift that we've been given, for helping us to accomplish everything in our work week, and for the plans that you have made for us for this upcoming week, for Jesus and his sacrifice that he made for us on the cross, for the gift of the spirit that you've given to us to guide us, for the opportunity of being together this day, we ask for your hand of blessing on this assembly, Lord. Lord, we pray on behalf of the people who are lost and in their need of you. We pray for those who are sick and weak, and those who are unable to attend. We pray for families who have suffered the loss of a loved one. Lord, we request of you to give us strength, to serve you, Lord. Give us more knowledge about you. Give us your presence today and guide us and direct our worship so that it is full of wisdom and reverence for you and your presence and for respect for one of another. In Jesus' name, we pray, Lord, and let us all say, amen. Good morning, church family. We have come to the portion of our service where we take our communion, and that is the taking of the broken body and the shedded blood. And we thank God at this time for allowing his son to come down from heaven on our behalf, that we may have everlasting life through his great sacrifice. And we do this by taking of the fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread. And we'll take the unleavened bread at this time. Would you bow with me? Father God, we thank you so much for allowing your son to come down from heaven to die on our behalf for the remission of our sins. We take this unleavened bread in remembrance of him and his great sacrifice. Let us all say amen. You may take the bread. And also we take the fruit of the vine, which is the shedded blood. Let us bow at this time and give Thanks for the shedded blood. Father God, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which is the shedded blood of our Lord and Savior, that we take it also in remembrance of him. Let us all together say, Amen. Yeah. 
provides for us to meet our daily needs. This is called tithing. By faith, we return to him a just representation of our regular income, which is called the tithe. Let's pray for the tithe. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in meeting our daily needs and for giving us the power to gain wealth. We acknowledge your faithfulness to us in our giving and through this form of giving uh, to support the ministry. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our second response is an acknowledgement of God's graciousness toward us. Your offering is, exp is an expression of gratitude for what God has done for you that you did not expect. 
When we give an offering, you're saying, thank you, Lord, for the special blessing that you bestowed upon me this week. And I return to you this token of thanksgiving for that blessing. Let's pray for the offering. Lord, we cheerfully bring our offerings in acknowledgement of your abounding grace toward us this week. And we ask that you bless these offerings that are given cheerfully and out of gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome you again to a, another online service of the Receda Boulevard Church in which our mission is to bring life. Uh, we say we are a church bringing life to the world and that's our objective, that's our ministry, that's our vision. Uh, it has a reference to what is promised in gospel faith. Christ says, I come that you might have life and that you might experience that life more abundantly. That is experience it to its fullness. It is times like this that we are challenged uh, to utilize our faith and the principles associated with faith uh, to experience the victory that God promises the believer. The promise of life was not conditional. That is, it was not simply a promise based upon fair skies. But we want you to know that this promise uh, applies even when we're going through difficult times. Now, what we're going to do uh, this day is focused upon, lays a focus upon a particular verse that is that is very relevant, you know, to what you are experiencing and how we are to be acting and behaving as believers in times like this. Now, let me first offer you four practical ways to get the most out of this 
message. Uh, because what we are using is a didactic approach, that is a teaching approach more than a proclamation approach in delivering these messages so you can get the most out of this. And that is, I want you to first find a seat, you know, that is get, get comfortable. And then secondly, print out the outline. If you're watching, if you're watching this uh, through the website, you might note that above the video is a button that says download uh, the sermon guide. You can follow the you can follow the message with the sermon guide. Print it out, and then turn off your phone. Don't allow yourself to be distracted, and then don't multitask. You know, practice those four things, and you'll get the most out of this out of this message. Now, I want you to note that a, a few years ago, a national survey was conducted uh, that targeted non Christians, and the question that was asked to these non Christians is, "What word best describe Christians that you know?" And I want you to note that the answers that came back, it was not that they are kind or are humble or loving or generous or people of integrity. The number one answer that came back was judgmental. They're judgmental, which is really the exact opposite of representing Jesus. And it gives some indication of how Christ is uh, being how Christians are portraying the image of Christ in our world and in cult in our culture. Now, notice in John, we're all familiar with that very famous passage in John three sixteen, where Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But many of us pay no attention to the to the verse that follows, which is very significant, where Christ really defines his mission in verse 17. He says, I did not come into the world to judge the world. I came to save it. Now, the Lord says, I did not come to be a judge. If you if you are commissioned by Christ as a believer, the Lord didn't save you to be a judge of the world. He saved you to follow the example of Christ. And that is to be a savior. Notice Christ says, I need not, you know, the, I need not judge the world. He says a person does not believe on the son of God. He said they're, they're condemned already. They're judged already. So the point is our responsibility is not condemnation, but salvation. Our focus today is going to be faith that enables me to show mercy over judgment, enables me to show mercy over the propensity that we have to be judgmental. I want you to note this text in James, the third chapter of the, the, the second chapter, actually verse 13, uh, which is a very important, you know, passage of, of scripture. Uh, and we're going to laser focus upon one particular phrase in this verse uh, that's very significant. Notice James says, this is James 3, verse 13. He says, you know, you must show mercy to others or God won't show mercy to you when he judges you one day. The person who shows mercy will stand without fear at the judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumph. That's the phrase that we want to pay attention to uh, in this message and get the full meaning of what he's saying when he says mercy triumphs over judgment. The first question I want to answer is then what is mercy? I want you to I want to give you a very practical uh, uh, definition of mercy that comes out of the word of God. And that is that mercy is love in action. Understand that mercy is more than a feeling. It's something that you have to do something with. In other words, uh, it is something you do. It is something you show. Mercy is shown. Second thing you need to understand is mercy is the opposite of judging and exercising judgment. And then the third thing is that mercy is more powerful. This verse helps us to understand that mercy triumphs over judgment. It is more powerful. It prevails. It wins the day. It wins over judgment. But understand, so understand that everything we have in life itself is due, you know, to God's to God's mercy. Life itself is due to God's mercy. Every waking moment, every heartbeat uh, that we experience is a result of the mercy of God. And today we're going to answer two questions. We will ask the question, why does God expect me to show mercy to everybody? And then the second question that follows is then how does God expect me to show mercy to everyone? 
So understand that God expects us to be agents of mercy. He saved us, you know, for us to show mercy to others. Now, why does God expect me to show mercy? I'm going to give you four reasons. Number one, because God continuously shows mercy to me. He continuously show me mercy. God is a merciful God. Everything that we experience, you know, it, every response to us, uh, to God is because of God's response to us. And that is uh, the mercy of God. Notice Ephesians, the ch second chapter, verses four and five. Paul says God is so rich in mercy. And he loves us so very much that when we were spiritually dead and doomed because of our sins, he gave us new life in Christ Jesus. There are two things I want you to note about the human plight and the human predicament that uh, would result from being that results from being apart from the mercy of God. And that is, number one, our predicament dead. That is nothing you can do. No power that, that you have to change yourself. No power you have to 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 help yourself. No self help books can help a person to effect change in their life, you know, without the mercy of God. Our predicament spiritually dead. Notice the plight doomed. We were hopeless. That means you were hopeless. God's mercy saves us. It keeps us alive. It spares us consequences that's caused by our own problems. Mercy is God taking consequences out of your life that you naturally merit or deserve. And grace is when God put blessings in your life that you are not deserving of. So the point is God's mercy uh, is, is prevailing. God expects you to in experiencing the mercy of God, when you allow yourself to be sensitive to God's mercy toward you, then he expects you to pass that mercy on to others. Notice in Matthew 18, verse 33, the Bible says, should not you have mercy on others just as I have mercy, I have shown mercy to you. So God expects us to show mercy to others because he is continuously showing mercy to us. Here's another reason uh, why God expects you to be merciful. And that is because God wants me to become like him. Now, I want you to note this passage in Hosea, the sixth chapter and verse six. Uh, God says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want you to be merciful. Now, this passage is so important that Jesus quotes it twice. He quotes this passage twice. God is saying this, that showing mercy is more important than worship. Now, notice the, the enormous implications of that as we're going through this pandemic, where the church now is forced uh, into a circumstance where we cannot meet together in terms of worshiping God. So we have to prioritize showing mercy uh, over worship because Mercy in the eye of in, in the eyesight of God is even more important than the sacrifices of, of worship. The strategic plan of the church at this time shouldn't be how are we going to get the community back into the church? The question is, how do we get the church into the community? I want you to know what the prophet Micah says as he gives a prophetic summary of what God expects of us as human beings. Notice in Micah, the sixth chapter, verse eight, the Bible says God has clearly shown you what is good and how he expects you to live. He said you must treat everyone justly. You must love mercy and walk humbly before God. Now, notice those three things. He says the first thing that God expects you to do is treat everyone justly. You know, love, liberty and justice for all. And then he says, love mercy. And then the third principle is to walk humbly before God, which is the root of the other two. Because if you treat other people unjustly, you and you are judgmental, you're really showing your own pride and ego and arrogance. So God expects you to show mercy because he's constantly showing mercy and continuously showing mercy to you and to me. Notice the third principle in terms of showing mercy, and that is because I need mercy to get into heaven. Do you not know Jesus says, if you refuse to forgive others, your father in heaven will not forgive you. That is, you can't receive anything from God that you're unwilling to give yourself. And of course, you know, the, the scripture states this principle two ways. First, negatively, it is stated in James 2 and verse 13, which is our text. And that is, if you don't show mercy, say when you stand in the judgment, you're not going to receive mercy. 
And then on the positive side in Matthew 5 and verse 7, Jesus says, uh, God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. Friends, you cannot afford to burn the bridge that you have to cross in order to get into heaven. You cannot get into heaven without being merciful toward others. Just understand that. Somebody come and say, well, preacher, you know, there's this person I just can't forgive. Then my response to you is then you just make sure that you don't sin again, because in some point in the future, you're going to need mercy. And if you are not willing to forgive others, you're not going to get mercy in your life. Here's the fourth reason uh, why you need to be merciful to everybody. And that is because being merciful is a remedy for depression. Do you not know when you start focusing on your own problems and you start caring about others? Do, do you not know that that lifts your spirit? It increases your energy. It produces happiness. Matthew 5 and verse 7 uh, says this. Happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Ask yourself this question. During the pandemic, who do you think are the most happiest people in the world? Do you think it's those who just sit at home and, 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 and don't seek in terms of what God may be doing and seeking his purposes, you know, but see, sit at home, gripe and complain? Or is it those who are, who are actually seeking ways and, and exercising themselves in terms of service toward others? We have a team of people in this church that is called God's Army. They are led by fellow by the name of, uh, of, of, of Brother Pew. And uh, they give out, they, they spend their time giving out food uh, to the community. Over 1,000 people are fed every week. They started right here, you know, at the Reseda Church, and then they took this ministry to the Semi Valley Church and fed people in Semi Valley. And then they brought this ministry to the Van Nuys Church and fed people in, in, in Van Nuys. And people from other congregations could pick up food and feed members of their community. Now they're back here at the Reseda Church doing the same thing, God's Army. And you look at these young people, you know, they're not being, uh, they're not being compensated for the, for their services rendered, you know, uh, in any, any, any meaningful way. But the point is they are receiving and experiencing the principle of what Jesus promised. Happy are those who are merciful for they shall obtain mercy. The universal principle, God has established this, this universe on principles and a universal principle of the universe is this. The more you help others, the more happier of the more you will receive. The more happier you're going to be and the more you're going to uh, succeed in life. The great example of this uh, in the Bible uh, is that story of Job. You know, you know the story. Job lost everything. He lost his health. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. And then his friends came to him and guess what they did? They judged him. They criticized him. They showed him no mercy whatsoever. They uh, they second guessed him. They they accused him of being responsible for for his circumstances. But note this, uh, his great turnaround, the great turnaround in that story came when Job prayed for his friends. These very people, these very friends that were second guessing and judging him. The Bible said when Job prayed for them, that's when things turned for Job. In Job 42 and verse 10, the Bible says after Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored Job's wealth and happiness, giving him twice as much as he had before, which means before the crisis. Friends, we have a choice. You have a choice. You can choose to be an agent of mercy or you can choose to be an agent of judgment. You know, as an agent of judgment, that is you criticize, you condemn and you 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 point out the flaws of others. You you judge others who don't measure up to your stat, your conditions and your standards and you make everybody around you miserable. Or you can be an agent of mercy as Jesus, you know, Jesus told the uh, Pharisees in Matthew seven and verse uh, ver uh, chapter 12 and verse seven. He says you would not have judged these men if you really knew the scripture that says I want you to be merciful. So, friend, God wants us to be agents. He saved us to be agents of mercy, of God's mercy. Now, the question is, then, how does God expect me to show mercy to others? Now, I want you to understand that mercy is like a diamond. It has various facets, you know, various points. And I want to give you four practical ways by which you can uh, demonstrate and exhibit and show the mercy of God. Here's the first one. Forgive people when they mess up. Second Corinthians chapter two and verse seven says, when people sin, you should forgive and comfort them so they won't give up in despair. 
See, our normal reaction when people hurt us is to get even, is to is to write them off and to become uh, and, and to become judgmental toward them. But notice God expects you to be an agent of mercy that forgives the fallen. You need to ask yourself and you can pray this prayer because Jesus was teaching this, you know, when in principle, when he was teaching his disciples to pray. You notice in Luke 11 and verse four, Jesus says, pray this, forgive our sins just as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Now, you need to ask you the question, can you really pray that prayer or do you really want to pray that prayer? The Lord is saying you are asking God, you, I want you, Lord, to forgive me in the same way or just as I forgive those who trespass or who sin against me. Friends, that's a true principle. And you need to recognize, you know, that your forgiveness has much to do, you know, with your willingness to forgive others. Your willingness to admit mistakes bears upon your success in life. According to Proverbs 28 and verse 13, Solomon says, whosoever refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Now, the question uh, that generates from this is who do you need to give another chance to? Friends, God expects believers to be people who extends to others a chance for a new life. The church is to be a place of second chances, a place to start where people can start over, where people who have messed up can pick themselves up and people who don't have it all together can get it all together. So the first thing that you need to do in terms of being an agent of mercy is to forgive people when they mess up. Here's the second principle and the second practice of mercy and showing mercy, and that is to be patient with odd behaviors, with the odd behaviors of others. Do you not know that we all have peculiarities? We all have odd behavior. We have mannerisms. We have idiosyncrasies. Uh, we have irritating habits, you know, that, uh, you know, that causes problems for others. But understand this, refusing to be upset, you know, with such people is what makes you an agent of mercy. Anytime you are not allowing somebody's idiosyncrasy, somebody's odd behavior, somebody's mannerism to upset you, you are extending to that person mercy. One of the best uh, principles of, of advice that, that we can give couples at this time who are stuck at home together. And when you're going through a situation like this where you are literally stuck at home uh, at times where you're not normally used to being together, you're going to find uh, and experience one another's idiosyncrasies and little things, little quirks, you know, that your spouse had because you are, but because you are different from one another, but you're going to begin to experience those differences. And what you need to recognize is that you need to make allowances for each other. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse number two, notice Paul says, be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Many marriages are buried, uh, buried because of so many digs that one spouse makes toward the other or each spouses are making toward each other. You keep making digs at your spouse and you're going to bury the relationship. You know, making allowances for the faults of others is what Paul refers to as glorifying Christ. Notice in Romans, the 15th chapter in verse seven, it says, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. He said, this brings glory to God. You know, so the way you glorify God is that is recognize, you know, how that when you were saved, God accepts you because of Christ, uh, not uh, and ignores your idiosyncrasies and all this stuff, but he accepts you. Then he says, then you're going to have to make the same allowances. Being an agent of mercy in marriage means accepting others instead of criticizing, instead of complaining and picking at them and and uh, uh, but accepting their peculiarities and their weaknesses. Notice in James, the second chapter, verse 13, in the Phillips translation, it says this. The man who makes no allowances for others will find none made for him. You're going to reap what you sow in life. Here's a third. Here's a third. Uh way by which you can uh, show mercy, and that is to show respect for people you disagree with. And let me tell you, uh, this is needed in times like this where we have so much polarization and such a divided world. Uh, knowing how to disagree without being disagree disagreeable is vitally important. 
in first Peter, the second chapter in verse 17, Peter says, treat everyone with dignity. And that word everyone means everybody. It includes people you don't lack, like, especially as we're approaching the fall election season, you know, where we're going to see so many, so, uh, so much polarization. We're going to see so much, uh, so much critique, uh, uh, so many attack ads and all of this, you know, we're going to need to know how to be agents of mercy. You know, the Bible says, the, you know, what, notice what Paul gives as the prescribed behavior for an agent of mercy uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. He said, don't, don't get bitter or angry or use harsh words that hurt each other. Don't yell at one another or curse or ever be rude. Instead, be kind and merciful. Notice mercy in this text is contracted with, contrasted with six negative responses. You know, that is to be, use harsh words and, and to curse and to hurt each other. You know, the question becomes, how do you rate yourself? as it relates to these qualities, these responses uh, to being an agent of judgment or mercy. Friends, we are sometimes often put in a position where we have to choose either to win the argument or to win the soul. Now, I want you to know that Christ is very radical about merciful behavior. He doesn't, he doesn't just simply define mercy, but he defined it in a very radical way. It, that is, it is way beyond tolerance. Notice in Luke chapter six and verse 35, Jesus said, love your enemies and do good to them. Lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high. Because God is kind to you. He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. He said, be merciful just as your father is merciful. I want you to know two things. Uh, that Paul gives us about uh, this type of behavior. Number one, mercy is beyond tolerance. He said, love your enemies. And then secondly, mercy is beyond verbalization of love. Do good to them. You know, the question becomes, when was the last time you did something good for somebody you disagree with, that you disagree, that you disagree with politically, socially, religiously? Or when was the last time you lent money to an enemy? I want you to understand this, and this is very important, that the Lord is not advocating compromise or not standing up for truth. No, he's not advocating that. You know, the principle is this. Truth telling is essential to conversion, but it is not essential it, uh, that it, it is not the methodology of conversion. You know, it is not the method that you use in trying to convert somebody in rebellion against God, showing mercy is that strategy, is God's strategy. So he is saying that mercy has to triumph over judgment, especially when it comes to reaching people. Here's the last principle in terms of how we can show mercy, and that is help anyone who is hurting. Wherever you, whenever you help anyone, you know, hurting, mercy is triumphing over judgment. The Good Samaritan story was used to illustrate that principle. You help someone when they need it. Proverbs, the third chapter, verse 27 says this. Whenever you whenever you possibly can do good to those who need it. Understand this, that merciful behavior is premeditated. It's intentional. You look for it. Uh, and the question and, and that is the assumption is if you care, you will be aware so what I want to do this week is challenge you uh, in this way. Commit an act of premeditated mercy. Note that there's always going to be tension between mercy and responsibility. And that's why we have the conservative politic uh, to remind us of this tension. But I tell you this, I'd, re I'd much rather come down on the side of being too generous, too gracious, too merciful, too forgiving than to come down on the side of being too judgmental. In other words, so you may ask the question, well, can a person over can, can a person go overboard in terms of showing mercy? And the question is, yes. The answer is yes, because Jesus did. In Titus, the third chapter in verse five, Jesus said this. Paul said this. Jesus saved us, not because of good things we did, but because of his mercy. He washed our sins away and gave us new life. Friends, the fact is that you cannot become 
a merciful person if you have not experienced God's mercy. You have to experience the mercy of God. You have to experience the merciful Savior. And how do you do that? There are four steps. First, you have to admit your need for salvation. You have to admit your need to be, reckoned, to be rescued from the human predicament. And then you have to accept Jesus as the one who is capable of rescuing you, capable of saving you. And then the third principle is that you have to acknowledge him as Lord. And that faith in him as Savior, that faith in him as Lord constitutes complete faith. And that faith has to be demonstrated in your first act of obedience is which in which he tells you to be baptized. You have to Act on his word in being baptized for the remission of all your past sins and to receive the gift of his spirit. After every service, we ask members to do three things. Number one, we ask you to appropriate, that is, to renew your commitment to the Lord by appropriating these principles, asking the Lord to help you uh, incorporate these principles into your life, into your heart, into your behavior. And then the third thing, the second thing we ask you to do is to look around and be conscious of anything that God is doing in your life, you know, that you uh, did not expect. Any abundance of grace that uh, that God is showing toward you. Acknowledge any gift that God has given you because God is doing these things in order to demonstrate to you his faithfulness. And you acknowledge that with offerings of thanksgiving that is that's not commanded, but expected. And then the third thing that we ask you to do is to find a group of people to discuss these things, use, utilize a social platform to discuss these principles with people, you know, that uh, you want to share your life with. Make that decision known. Whatever your response to the message is, make it known to your host and make it known to your group and they will see that your needs are met. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Father, we're so grateful for who you are and we're grateful, Father, for the opportunity that you have given us uh, to be mercy, to be agents of mercy, the reasons and the motives that you give us to be agents of mercy, and then the reasons uh, and the expressions and the know-how that comes through your word uh, in terms of exercising mercy in our lives and in our fellowship. Father, help us to do these things, to know these things, and to express these things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.